This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So we're going to go through together and look at this example, which is all about the group statement of changes in equity. So pulling together the information that we looked at in the previous video. What I want us to go through and look at, if you look at the requirement first, is it wants us to prepare the consolidated statement of changes in equity. Is it there for the penny group? So penny must be the parent. And is it there for the year ended December 20x5? So December 20x5 is the end of the year. That will be our closing figures. Uh, and what you've got, again, you're not going to get a question like this in the real exam, but it helps you understand the group statement of changes in equity. Uh, it tells us about our parent company, Penny, and its only subsidiary, is it there, Sophie? So Penny is the parent, Sophie is the subsidiary. Uh, and you can see that for each of their individual situations, you've got the opening figures, you add the profit, you subtract the dividends to get you there, is it to the closing figure? Okay. Uh, so what they are showing you effect effectively it, it is the equity, isn't it? All the equity in Penny at the start of the year, all the equity in Sophie at the start of the year, and then how that equity has moved to get down to the closing figure. Okay. Uh, bits of information that you've got are that we own 70% of the subsidiary. So if that's the case, we have a 30% non-controlling interest. Uh, we're told that that acquisition took place on the 1st of January X2, so several years ago. And we're told there that the total equity was 48.2 million. And the reason why that is important is because we can go through there and look at Sophie's equity at the start of this 20x5 year. We can compare that, can't we, to the equity when the subsidiary was acquired. So we could go through there, couldn't we, and look at the post acquisition movement in the equity. Okay, that will then go to the NCI and then part of it will go to the parent, won't it? It says the first dividend Sophie has paid since acquisition is the amount of four million shown in the summarised statement above. Uh, so you've got there two dividends, haven't we? Uh, the dividend that's paid by Penny will show that, won't we, as 100% being paid to the parent. But when we look there at Sophie's, what's due between the group and the outside world is the non-controlling interest share, isn't it? So there'll be some easy points to go through and get there. Uh, tiny point, just to make life easier, the profit for the period of 51.2 in Penny's summarised statement of changes in equity. So it is referring to this figure here above. Uh, does not include its share of the dividend paid by Sophie. And the reason why that's phrased as such is because if Penny had recorded its dividend from Sophie, then we would need to eliminate it because that is intragroup. Okay. Uh, and then it says it's group policy to value non-controlling interest based upon the proportionate share is it of your net asset method. OK, so lots and lots of important information there to digest. What we'll go through and do is draw up your pro forma for your group statement of change in equity. So you can see there down the left hand side, you've got your opening figures, your profit, your dividend and then your closing figures. And then across the top, you've got the amount attributable to the parents and the amount attributable to the non-controlling interest. Okay. Uh, the way in which I'd attack it is that I would do the dividends first. That tends to be easier. I would then follow it with the profit before I then look at the opening figure. And then the closing figure at the end is just a balancing figure, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so to work out the dividends, that should be nice and straightforward. Because within the dividends, we just have the, is it 100% of the parent's dividend, which is paid out to the parent shareholders. And then for the NCI, we need to show the non-controlling interest share of the dividend, don't we? So we're going to have to go through and take 30% of that 4,000. So the dividend for the parent, I think if we get that right, was that the as 10,000? So remember that there isn't it is 100% of P. But then for the NCI, we want to show that the NCI received 30%. Is it of S's dividend? 
Okay, so 30% of 4,000 is that there as 1,000. 200. Again, don't forget those figures need to go in brackets to show that they are a distribution of the earnings. Okay. Uh, profit figure. Normally, you could just take that from the group statement of profit or loss. However, it's better to go through here and do a working because we're not given the group statement of profit or loss. So let's draw it up. So if we look at the group profit for the year, we consolidate 100% of P plus 100% of S. So does that give me 61, 200? As I add my 51, 200, and also my 10,000. So that's 100% of P and 100% of S, isn't it? Okay. Uh, we then need to split that, don't we? And we split that into the amounts attributable to. Is it the parent and the non-controlling interest? Well, the non-controlling interest own 30%, don't they, of S's profits the year and S's profits for the year are there at 10,000 aren't they so the non-controlling interest is 3,000 and therefore the amounts that are attributable to the parent must be the balancing figure mustn't it is that at 58,200 Uh, so what we're doing there is we're doing the, the, the group statement of profit or loss. The consolidation, there's nothing within it in terms of pub adjustments, fair value adjustments. It's just going through there, consolidating 100% of P, 100% of S, and then doing the profit split at the end. OK, if we take those figures, 58, 200 and 3000. I can plug those in, can't I? into my group statement of changes in equity. And again, for the opening figures, I need to do a working, don't I? That working, it's up to you which one you do first. Uh, we've got their choice of two. So we've got there, shall we go through and look at the amounts attributable to the parent first? So we need to look at 100% of equity at the start of the year that should be nice and straightforward because you've got 100% of P's equity at 280250 within the question there so I can put that in 280250 remember you're thinking of working five your, your group retained earnings aren't we here it's group equity as opposed to retained earnings. So that we then add on our share. So is that 70% of the subsidiaries post acquisition movement in equity? So here the equity at the year end was 85,100. At acquisition it was 48,200, which I think when you tap that into your calculator, gives you 25830 because what you've got there is when you look at the post acquisition movement i think that's 36900 and 70% of that is 25830 adding that up i think it gives you is it 306080 so that there is your group Amount attributable to the equity holders of the parent at the start of the year. So 306080. 306080 is your opening figure. Hopefully, you're all happy with that there. Think working 500% of P plus P share of S's post acquisition. Post acquisition, what movement in equity? 
Uh, you've then got the last little bit. Is that going through there and looking at the non-controlling interest? So if we go through there and put in the non-controlling interest. Remember the way we work the non-controlling interest is we put the non-controlling interest at acquisition, isn't it? To which we then add on the non-controlling interest share of the post-acquisition profits. Remember here, the NCI was based upon a proportionate share of net assets method. So the non-controlling interest at acquisition will be 30% of the equity at acquisition, which was 48.2 million. 30% of 48.2 million gives me 14, 460. The post acquisition movement in equity of the sub is that 36,900. If you're curious as to where that came from, we just calculated it before, didn't we? We looked at the closing equity, or the equity at the start of the year of 85,100. Looked at the equity when the subsidiary was acquired at 48,200, and the movement was 369. 30% of that 369 gives me, is it 11070? And if you total that up, I think that should go through there and give you, is it 25530? Okay. Excellent. Uh, so 25530 is the NCI at the start of the year. And then once you've done that, you are aware you can just total everything up. So the closing equity attributable to the parent shareholders is 354. 280. And the amounts attributable to the NCI are 27330. There we go. Uh, exam questions. I think we mentioned earlier on with, within the introduction video and how to do the group statement to change in equity. A lot of this is tested with regards to your changes in group structure. If it isn't tested with your changes in group structure, you could be asked for any one of those six things. Yeah, your dividend is split into two. What's attributable to the parent and what's paid to the non-controlling interest. So make sure you can calculate those two figures there. I'd have thought that those two are, are pretty straightforward, aren't they? Okay, there's nothing too much to remember there. 100% of P and the NCI share of S. Uh, the profit is a little bit trickier, isn't it? Uh, you need to go through, if it hasn't been done already, you will need to go through there and do the profit split. It makes it a bit challenging. So work out the group profits and then work out the non-controlling interest share in S's profit before you then work out the amount attributable to the parent as a balancing figure like, like we did there. Okay, we worked out the group profits by adding them across. We then worked out the amount attributable to the parent by working out the NCI first, didn't we? Which was 30% of S's profits for the year. Uh, once you've done that, I think that the opening figures, I say very hard, but I suppose the more you practice it, the, the easier it becomes, isn't it? Uh, but when you're there, you're thinking, aren't you, about a, a working five as your group retained earnings, as a working four as your non-controlling interest. But instead of doing it at the close of the year like you do in your SFP, we're looking at it there at the end of the year. Again, you know, the only way to get good at these things is to practice the questions. So keep working the questions in whichever revision kit you have at your disposal. And we will see you all within the next chapter.